So hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue to Race, Gentrification and Resistance, Reclaiming the Rights to Our City. We are so excited for this conversation and so pleased that you could join us in person or over Zoom. You're welcome to walk behind me here, it's okay. <laughs> Folks who are just coming into the space, no worries. Uh, just to situate you in terms of where you're, we are right now, we are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University's fourth space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage or Montreal. As caretakers for the lands and waters we are meeting on here today, we are grateful to the Kanyankahaga Nation for their teachings about the earth and our relations. For those of you who are new to Force Space, either in person or on Zoom or following on the YouTube live stream, welcome one and all. Um, at Force Space, we collaborate with our university community to activate the many research projects and initiatives and development across the university by co-creating engaging activities such as today's panel conversation. We also support Concordia's Public Scholars program by activating their research interests via Force Space. So it's our great pleasure to welcome Miko Tarius and her invited guests in today. So on that note, that's it for me. I'm passing it over to you, Miko. Welcome. Uh, hey guys. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. My name is Miko. I'm a PhD student at Concordia University and a public scholar. I'm also a white immigrant from France and I use she, her as pronouns. Today I have the pleasure of serving as your MC and moderator for this event. Um, now I would like to begin with an acknowledgement, sorry. Uh, the Ganegahaga Night Nation is recognized as the custodian of the lands and the waters on which we gather today. Jojage, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today is at home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Also, researching the gentrifying process in North America, I would like to acknowledge the ongoing colonialism in both urban and rural territories across Quebec and Canada. Talking about colonization and dispossession, gentrification has been a hot topic in Montreal and many other cities across Canada. It has complex and far-reaching uh, effects. During the next hour, we'll try to unpack the concept of gentrification, its relation to race and racism, its impact on our neighborhoods and how people and communities get organized to push back. To discuss this pressing issue, I have the pleasure of welcoming five panelists. Dr. Margaret Ramirez, who is on Zoom, um, assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramirez, for being with us today. Um, Dr. Ted Ritland, associate professor at Concordia University. Simon Chen, Working member at Cooperative de Solidarité, La Place Commune et Park Extension and member of Park Anti Eviction Mapping Project. Wawali, um, former Chinatown Working Group member and independent artist. And last but not least, Andy Vu, urban planner at Montreal's Chinatown Roundtable. Thank you all for joining us today. Before going any further, I would like to do a quick one round table uh, by asking our panelists to introduce themselves and their experience studying and resisting gentrification. So let's start with Margaret. Um, can you talk a bit about your work and your experience working on such pressing subjects? Thank you so much for that introduction, Mako. It's really wonderful to be here with you all virtually. I wish I was sitting at the table, but it's a pleasure. Um, so I was born and raised on in the San Francisco Bay Area on Ohlone territories in a Mexican-American household. Um, and my interest over the years in terms of my research and my activism has always been on the modes of social organizing that really enable marginalized communities to envision and put another world into practice on how to address the immediate injustices of the present while also creating alternate futures, other ways of being. Um, and so I always sort of begin by saying I never actually intended to study gentrification. It was my relationship with the city of Oakland that actually, and the communities there that really nudged me into doing this work. Um, I was away from the Bay Area for five years when I went to do grad school in Seattle, Washington. And when I returned to Oakland in 2013, I really found the city markedly changed. I was having a hard time recognizing the geographies that I had held so dear. Um, and upon my return, I actually had a totally different dissertation project planned. Um, I quickly realized that I couldn't talk about anything going on in Oakland at that particular moment without talking or addressing gentrification um, and making sense of the profound sense of loss 
that I and many other long-term Oakland residents were feeling in the city we call home. Um, so just really quickly, since that time, I've collaborated um, with a few Oakland-based organizations addressing various forms of ongoing dispossession in the Bay Area that emerge in form of displacement, policing, uh, and addressing longer histories that inform these struggles. Um, and as an aside, just because I know we have some other anti-eviction mapping uh, representation on the panel, I'm also a co-editor of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project's 2021 Counterpoints Atlas, um, in which we really built an archive of data, maps, and testimonies that really flesh out the many layers of the housing crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'll sort of leave it at that. Wow, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, what about you, Sina? How did you end up fighting against gentrification? What does it represent to you? So it's a big question. And mm -hmm. also, like um, Margaret said, uh, it's not something that I went, that I purposefully like uh, went into thinking I was going to be working a lot uh, against gentrification. But um, it's true that it's a reality for a lot of people that work in the community and that have um, ties in specific communities because it's a problem that neighborhoods all over North America are facing uh, everywhere. So. Um, yeah, my work at La Place Commune in the neighborhood of Park Extension has led me a lot to be involved in the fight against gentrification happening in that neighborhood because it's a neighborhood that is um, really highly contested right now. The last 10 years um, of policy have led to the point of um, where we're at now, which is a really aggressive gentrification and displacement of the people who live in the neighborhood, um, super rapid change in the class and the populations of the people that are living there um disruption of all the social fabrics that have been created by the community members living there over the past 40 years um and so there's no way to be inactive in a situation like that when your work is in the community and you're trying to help mobilize people in the community be able to specifically the work that i do in the press community is all about um food solidarity uh food security but we choose to say food solidarity because our approach is a little bit different than the um, charity approach of food security um so yeah basically that's the beginning of how i got involved in the struggle in park extension because um it's an issue that is touching every single individual who lives and uh works in this neighborhood i'll pass Sorry. on the, the introduction <laughs> go you want to go sure thanks hi everyone um i'm wawa um so just a little bit like background i grew up and immigrated in wendake wendake's people quebec city and then i moved here to montreal five years ago um but i have um elder families in chinatown since i'm very young so i would always come and i actually believe that montreal was chinatown for the longest time <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, and artistically speaking, well, yeah, so I started as a former member, no, I started as a member of former Chinatown working group with Andy, and uh, now I do independent work as an artist, and I'm pretty new to all this, um, and I remember coming into Chinatown working group as, you know, coming as a first generation immigrant standpoint, but then I was wondering how can art actually have an impact in social justice issues or gentrification? And so, yeah, um, artistically, artistically speaking, I'm interested into um, the idea of taking back public space, more in situ uh, type of um, projects or um, initiatives. But yeah, in Chinatown Waking Group, um, it's more about hearing the voice of living community and elders, especially. So yeah, we did initiatives in the last year, as um, such as all the all candidate debates to. Um, to raise political activity from the residents and because we're just you know i just have a personal touch with the community and elders i know what are the clashes i know what are the the kind of the needs and the things that are lacking there so yeah that's pretty much it what about you andy yeah hi my name is andy i'm an urban planner and uh, i grew up in low burgundy in montreal uh, so i've seen uh, quite the change uh, in, over there. Uh, also, I went to school in St. Henry, so I, I saw the change through time over there about the gentrification, the changes in the businesses over there. And then uh, I started really um, helping, to, being more active in the community um, with uh, the Chinatown Working Group, uh, where I, I was giving my insight on the uh, municipal world and how it functioned and putting various uh, planning tools uh, forward and to be available to the community. 
So this is how I started uh, the community work with the Chata Working Group and helping them out uh, learn about how we can fight against gentrification through planning process. Nice. Last but not least. Um, great question. So I came to thinking about gentrification as part of a larger kind of analysis and fight against displacement. So I grew up on Anishinaabe territory in northeastern Ontario. Um, my family is about eight generations of white settlers on this land, uh, mostly from England and Ireland. Um, and so I grew up in evidently sort of colonized territory shaped by displacement, although I didn't really understand that very well when I was a kid, honestly. Uh, in my 20s, I lived in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and that's where I started to see how um, living in this place <laughs> in any kind of um, livable way it meant finding a way to be in solidarity with African Nova Scotian folks who are facing, you know, 200 years of displacement on that land. Um, and I mostly, you know, did that work by, by through research, um, like trying to assemble like archival research and data analysis that supports the demands of communities struggling against displacement. And when I moved to Montreal in 2010, I've sort of continued that work, usually by partnering with um, housing groups in various neighborhoods undergoing gentrification to, again, like sometimes put data behind the things that they're already observing, which maybe does something. But obviously, the, the most important work is actually the organizing work that that as, as a researcher, we can only just support. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for this. Um, so talking about gentrification, I'm going to ask you first, uh, Margaret and Ted, uh, to try to impact the concept of gentrification. We know that it became a buzzword over the past few years. It described changing urban neighborhoods, obviously, but what does it actually mean? Like, what, how would you guys define gentrification? Want me to start? I just want to say you can call me Maggie, too. Sorry, I don't often go by Margaret. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. When I first, whenever I, when I, like, hear the, uh, or request to sort of define how we're thinking of gentrification, my mind always goes to two things. Um, one of them is... Um, Ananya Roy has an article where she engages with um, a Los Angeles based organizer, organization, organizer named Pete White, where he really insists that what we are experiencing, what they're experiencing in Los Angeles cannot be explained by gentrification alone. There's also sort of a, a retort of like, why do you get such a nice word in the form of gentrification? Um, and this this quote that Roy draws on in this testimony from from Pete White, I was always really stuck with me and my own experience talking with people in Oakland um, whose geographies are, are slowly and sometimes quickly being pushed off the map. Um, so for me, gentrification is not as simple as, you know, rents going up, uh, real estate prices going up, people moving elsewhere, higher income folks coming in. This is rather we need to really think about the long histories and think about gentrification in the form of systematic dispossession of vulnerable communities. Um, and the second moment that I always think of is when I was interviewing, when I was doing my dissertation work, um, one of the founders of an organization called Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice um, named George Galvis. Um, and he really explicitly spoke to me about gentrification going hand in hand with policing in Oakland um, and, many, and thinking about sort of the many ways that the state works to destabilize and dispossess communities so as to redevelop and attract capital into particular neighborhoods. So I learned from him and through dialogue with him as well about the ways that we need to sort of pan out and look at the multiple factors over time that lead to displacement. Um, so I think what I'm getting at is just um, the term gentrification alone to me doesn't do enough work at, at calling our attention to the long histories and geographies that make it so particular communities are dispossessed time and time again, because what we see in the longer history of across North America is that time and time again, um, the same communities are being dispossessed. Um, so what is happening in cities that the world and across the world really at present cannot be understood in this within this particular moment in time that we have to consider these broader processes of racial capitalism and settler colonialism in the North American context and think about how they've systematically against excluded the same communities time and time again. Um, so yeah, so I just want to push back a little bit on the on the term um, and how we need to sort of expand the frame a little bit to, to fully encapsulate this, the modes of dispossession that we're witnessing. Yeah, definitely. What, what do you think about 
what just said. Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that that is beautiful. Um, and so maybe I'll try to add something which I think responds to another question you have. Um, I think that, yeah, we need to think about this as part of a larger transhistorical process of dispossession and displacement, which means that, you know, we often cite gentrification as beginning sometime in the 60s or 70s. Obviously, there was displacement and dispossession before that, which looks quite similar. And also there are being people being displaced and dispossessed in areas that aren't going undergoing gentrification. So we we lose the struggle if we see it, if we are only fighting gentrification and not thinking about these broader processes. And maybe what I'll say is some one of the ways that I try to think about it is systemically, which is, you know, what Maggie said is really important. And also, I think sometimes when we have discussions about gentrification, it gets very individualized. We think about like what, whether it's okay to live in this neighborhood or that neighborhood, um, which, you know, are fine reflections to have. But if we're not reflecting on the systemic nature of the problem, we're never going to do anything about it. And so I would say that, you know, we can think about it in terms of an economic, political and cultural process. And so economically, we can think about how gentrification emerges as a new phase of capital accumulation through the urban landscape, sort of in the 60s and 70s. The usual way of describing that is that for the first two thirds of the 20th century, capital was largely invested in urban sprawl, building new suburbs, subdivisions. Um, there's a process of white flight and middle class flight to the suburbs during that, that period. Simultaneously, you know, um, urban neighborhoods get disinvested, basically like housing falls apart if you don't if you don't keep it up. And so if there isn't capital constantly being invested in the residential landscape. It degrades. Um, and then with, you know, various things that are happening in the 60s and 70s, you have capital seeing new opportunities to, to profit by investing some of that capital in the revitalization of other urban neighborhoods. And so it's a, like a global capitalist process. Um, and that's part of what we're up against. Politically, we can see the ways that like white settler states um, are invested in supporting particular kinds of lives and communities, which trend, tend towards whiteness um, and sort of normative whiteness in particular. Um, and that's, you know, a process that goes back about 500 years um, that gets overlaid with a kind of urban crisis in the 60s and 70s, where cities are finding that they're losing their tax base to the suburbs. Um, and so begin this process of like revitalizing the city, making the city better, making it more livable, making it more ecological, all these things which end up um, furthering the gentrification process and producing a, a kind of better life for the privileged uh, and displacement for everybody else. And then culturally, um, I think there's this complicated process whereby maybe from the 60s and 70s onward, both certain kinds of businesses and certain kinds of middle class people start to define themselves um, in opposition to the suburbs. This is a sort of bland, um, like homogenous uh, suburban culture, which isn't really what's happening in the suburbs. So it's a way of imagining it and in proximity to kind of the grit, the, the oldness, the density of the city. And so you see both a certain kind of business that wants to be located uh, in the city um, because of the image that it brings. You see um, certain kinds of people who work for those companies or people who just like live in the city, want to build an identity around that kind of lifestyle, um, which again, there that's like not separate from this like 500 years of settler colonialism. You see there's like, there's this constant kind of white desire for the frontier and for the newness and for the edge. And I think that, you know, when people do interviews with gentrifiers, there's often a sense that they've chosen to live there because like it's new, it's still happening, it's up and coming, which is a very colonial, white colonial, southern colonial kind of disposition. Um, and it's it's hitched on to by the state and by capital uh, to redevelop neighborhoods and, and displace and dispossess people in continuity with these larger processes that Maggie's pointing towards. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Um, Maggie, um, you've been studying gentrification using race. Um, we talk a lot about gentrification as a class-based process. Uh, in Oakland specifically, how did you analyze this process using race and, yeah, critical right, race theories, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you, Ted. You can see we're, we're very aligned in our thinking on this. Um, I just wanted to really quickly point out to the two things that um, that Ted pointed to that I thought were really important that also relate to um, this latter question is just like, I feel like it was important that you said that 
for the frame of gentrification sort of um, brings our focus to the urban alone and that disconnects us from the sort of broader um the broader scene or scale of, through which capitalism is is accumulating and, and dispossessing people but that's and that's a really important point um and i also wanted to sort of relate um and maybe i'll do this in, in relation to oakland as well um but just so we're thinking about you know the the process of gentrifying and as neighborhoods are deemed desirable by particular populations a way that's the ways that that is racialized right um often um, i think brandy summers's work has been really excellent in in showing us the ways that blackness has been fetishized and sort of uh the made sort of desirable in terms of what neighborhoods are are then um determined to be you know desirable for for populations to come in and gentrify um and this is something that we see really explicitly um in oakland um, and so if I just to speak a little bit to the sort of broader histories along the same lines that Ted was just talking about, um, that in, in the case of Oakland, the black community at present is, um, along with the indigenous Latinx and Asian communities of the cities, um, have been uh, really significantly displaced, particularly over the last 20 years or so. Um, so Oakland's black population in 1980 was at 47 percent of the city. And um, it's now, as of 2020, 2020 census data is down to 20 percent um, and 7 percent of that population was lost in the last decade alone. Um, and so that's where we see sort of gentrification playing in as a factor. But it's I think it's important to really also scale back and see what other forces have, have come into play over the years um, and why it requires us to really think about the function of racial capitalism, how race and racism are utilized to create an other so as to fuel and justify exploitation um, and extraction from communities. Um, so this loss of population, 7% of the black population in the last 10 years um, really requires us to think about the impact of the foreclosure crisis in the United States um, at following 2008 uh, recession that disproportionately affected black households in Oakland um, and uh, and this is also was led up by the fact that black and other minoritized communities were targeted for the variable rate mortgages that then led to default following that that housing crash in 2008. Um, and as Ted was already pointing us towards, um, we also we also have to think even broader in the frame to think about uh, the impact of urban renewal programs on the black community of Oakland in the 1960s, which targeted black pop black neighborhoods and households. Um, as sites of blight. Um, there was lots of literature coming out at the federal level, along with the local level, um, that was declaring local, Oakland, West Oakland in particular, as a needed site and a site that be, needed to be redeveloped. Um, and you see a lot of cultural language in there too, which was sort of blaming, you know, cultural poverty narratives, where they're blaming uh, the the inhabitants of West Oakland for uh, the for causing the blight themselves by very presence of of blackness. Um, the association of blackness with sort of slums and blight was very explicit in, uh, in those justifications for redevelopment. Um, and we also have to think even further back and think about in, in the 1930s and 1940s when racial housing covenants and redlining um, only allowed black residents to live in these same areas, the same neighborhood of West Oakland and, and other areas um, adjacent to the, the shoreline in the city that were later targeted for this demolition. Um, and justified via eminent domain that you know whole blocks were were demolished to build um, transit systems, um, and then even, even if we were going to stretch it even farther back to think back uh, when we saw the first great migration of black migrants from the U.S. South um, from the 1910s, the 20s, and the 30s um, that were fleeing conditions, the sharecropping conditions that were so um, very close to the conditions of slavery. You had people living as sort of in, in servitude um, to these sharecropping systems. Um, so people coming out West looking not just for opportunity, but the ability to live free of white terror. Um, so this is all to say, I'm just panning out in this way to really think about how these long histories across geographies and across across time are, are really linked in the present circumstances. They're not distinct, right? Gentrification is just this is more the newest guise for accumulating wealth through the dispossession of black and other minoritized communities. Um, and this is something that Adam Blesdo and Willie Wright argue that is the presumed aspatiality of black communities and other minoritized communities that enables redevelopment projects to justify the displacement of these same communities time and time again. So to me, it's it's really 
um, race and, and gentrification that really need to be talked about um, in tandem. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, I'm just going to turn to turn to you guys, so we can hear about your own experience uh, experiencing actually gentrification. How did it materialize in your life, and how? Yeah, what does it represent to you right now? Um, well, I would say super spot on what Maggie and Ted have laid out as the foundation of like what gentrification is. Um, and it's really important that I think we keep that kind of systematic and historical view of how displacement is occurring because there's a myth that a lot of people believe that gentrification, because it's such a simplified, you know, it's not an ugly word, it's like a nice word in a way, it sounds nice, gentrification, like it's a natural, normal thing. It's really not natural at all and it's not normal and it's super actually possible to contest it and to resist it, but people have... Um, uh, accepted in a way that gentrification uh, is just a normal process of life in North America of a modern city. But as Ted and Maggie have just explained, it's really a set of policies that allow a continued um, exploitative industry to continue using real estate and the financialization of housing to continuously displace, as Maggie said, the same people who are coming from geographies that are often already um, colonized by white North American settlers. So. Um, I think it's really accurate what they've said, um, and it completely applies in every context that I've seen in Park Extension, how gentrification has played out in my neighborhood and seeing, um, yeah, seeing this process of, of people being uh, forcefully displaced and their community ties broken because of um, the investment to uh, improve the neighborhood in a way that completely disregards the existence of the people who live in the neighborhood already. Um, so, yes, let's share the mic with yeah. Andy and Goldberg, guys. Yeah, to hop on, Maggie and Ted are very accurate about the definition of gentrification because even in Chinatown, well, first I would like to say that uh, I'm only representing my own views and as an urban planner and as a member of the community because the Chinatown, uh, Montreal Chinatown Roundtable is still uh, a new organization. and. Uh, but first, we have to put in context uh, the Montreal Chinatown, which is the last one in the province of Quebec. And after the completion of the railroad in the West, Chinese immigrants came here. It, it has been historically served as a physical and cultural shelter that was excluded from the labor and rental market. So that's why they've been all, uh, they were all went in Chinatown, right? So the neighborhood is still an, today an important social, cultural, uh, commercial hub. Uh, and its spatial boundaries have really changed over time because of all those urban renewal projects. And because it is situated close to downtown, it was still subject to the tension of gentrification and such as speculation of the land with many parkings, uh, rising of property values, the displacement and destruction of over 200 buildings uh, from urban renewal projects. And if we really, um, we situate ourselves geographically. The boundaries are uh, a direct result of many large-scale infrastructure projects, uh, such as the Boulevard René Lévesque, the Ville Marie Expressway, um, the Complex des Jardins, the Palais des Congrès, and also the Complex Kifavo. But more more recently, there's also this the uh, Dichum, the Centre Hospitalier Universal de Montréal, uh, on the east side, which all of these projects contribute to in enclavement of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So really, we've seen this through time and time historically that Chinatown is being enclaved and set there. And, you know, being surrounded by districts such as the Quartier Latin, the Old Port, the Business District, and also the Quartier des Spectacles, it contributes to, on, on one hand, like the affluence of people going there, but really what enables it is that it brings a real estate pressure and speculation that destabilize the balance between the, the users of the district over there. So since 2019, the Chinatown Working Group has been, uh, has raised concerns about those new construction uh, developments in Chinatown because those did not consider their in insertion in the, in the area. Um, their publicity, their marketing always um, talked about the location downtown, uh, the proximity near the old port or uh, the Quartier des Spectacles, but they 
they leave out that they're in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very, um, it's, it's frustrating to see all of this uh, going forward. And it's really promoting a lifestyle that uh, cater for a different type of clientele. Even in their marketing, they say that it's luxurious con condos, but in Chinatown, mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't say it. And during the pandemic, uh, Chinatown was hit with discrimination, uh, drastic decline of uh, visits, and developers really started to mass buy properties in Chinatown. So this is uh, something that residents that live there uh, reported to media, reported to the Chinatown Working Group. So um, there was a petition to protect this historical uh, area. And, yeah. Thanks, Andy. So. Um... Thanks for all the takes on gentrification. And because I knew we were going to have experts definition on the subject, I Googled and took this simply as and flat as one. <laughs> uh, so gentrification as the transformation of a city neighborhood from a low um, value to high value, very flat. So, so yeah, as gentrification involves occupation of a space that has its own history and that's already occupied by an organized community, living community, um, I thought that the redefinition of the concept of value is very key to this uh, issue, especially when it comes to culture, because there's a slow process of assimilation and redefinition of what is valuable and relevant anymore, right? And I, I take that from my, from what I see in fashion with the definition of, definitions of trends. So as an artist um, that works, um, that has field work at the Chinatown community, um, through art opportunities and with experience with Chinatown Working Group, um, I have witnessed another type of gentrification you know, there's like the obvious one that we've been talking about, but there's another one that I would kind of call um, cultural gentrification. This is not a scholar definition, <laughs> but um, yeah, to me, cultural uh, gentrification serves the means of gentrification in application because it, it creates needs and kind of this kind of sexiness around the new lifestyles, hence the reasons to implement new infrastructures and buildings in a neighborhood. So it's a type of gentrification in itself to me um, and as art uh, is a vehicle for collective narratives and memory it has the potential to play an indirect role in either gentrifying or preserving the community of a neighborhood um, many of the projects led by institutions um, like initiatives are somehow in collaboration with an organization from the neighborhood but this organization in the neighborhood is uh, represents more, more often than never the business class of, of the neighborhood. So um, then it's presented as good for the entity, and that's why it kind of gets levy. But you know this is this is questionable. And mainstream organizations comes to you know propose project in Chinatown without consulting or inquiring what are, what the needs are or what how to represent them properly. So. Um, as an artist in signing up, which is the paradox is like as an artist in signing up to working within institutions, um, we're aware that we're contributing to the process of gentrification. But paradoxic paradoxically, um, we carry on um, because you know that if it's not you, it's going to be someone else. So it's kind of inevit inevitably happening. It's always this uh, duality and there's always a question of who's the audience. And at, it's, at this point, it's more of you know, if if you believe that you if you believe that the one that you're bringing with you through your art is worth it, it's might as well jump and do it. But um, in diaspora art um, movement, um, it's often expected from us to serve like an idealized versions of Asian cultures, um, which for me I believe is pretty perverse. And in the context of Chinatown, it's actually obvious, you know, because it suits the current marketing Chinatown. A narrative. So um, I know that when I know that this is what's expecting for me when I, you know, when I approach by institutions to do work in Chinatown. Um, but the thing is, like, we have so much, much, so much more to offer, and we have so much more. We've been raised in two cultures, you know. We've we've we're tough, and we have stuff to tell. So we're just so much more than these capitalist narratives of our cultures. So. If I come back to the concept of audience, um, you know, when you're doing art, so who are you representing when you do art in, your, in a neighborhood and what is the targeted audience? And so, you know, in, in my case, um, what I care most about are the elders from the Chinatown. 
Um, and when I tell my elders about my implications in the neighborhood, I always get the, the classic, I don't care, <laughs> the classic, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So this is like, I feel like this, these are conversations that we don't, um, you know, on the, on the ground level that we forget. Um, you know, the, ironically, the elder resident class of Chinatown is the most at risk under gentrification. And they, uh, they kind of will never know. They're just not informed. Uh, they're alienated from the, from the conversations or they're just already struggling right now. So, um, so we have the role as activists to inform them and, or just youth to inform them and to keep them in a conversation and inform the merchants on what's happening around them. Because there's also like so much nuances when I say merchants, of course, like we talk about the, um, the business class of the neighborhood, but there's a business class of the neighborhood that serves their, the people that lives there. So we're not talking about them, right? So it's just all nuanced uh, when we ask, like, who's, who are we talking to and which audience are we serving when we're doing activism? And what will happen when the new rich clientele will be installed there? Who's going to fall under, will displace, will be displaced? And, um, in some projects, um, from my experience, the integrity of my vision was protected through the support of um, commu community members, advisory committees uh, that was composed of people from the community. So on our end, as artists, um, we kind of have to always have a conversations with the, with the, um, with the community because um, we're going to need solidarity and cultural resilience mm -hmm. in the process. And it seems like, maybe it seems like nothing, but it's in the union of the community of the community that we were able to block like ugly like murals projects that are that are not that are made from people that are not from the community or just um made from people that don't give a shit honestly about the community so it was through uh, solidarity that we were capable of just saying no like this is not what we want this is not going to happen and it actually didn't happen because of that so all about those art initiatives led by institutions and new new business installing in neighborhoods it's always um the same questions that i've been saying since the beginning like how are they making the lives of the living community better how are the spaces that they're taking um accessible to the living community uh is it accessible or it's gated with opening hours you know or and keeping the facade of a building is not enough as an action we need to we're losing more and more of those establishment that serves a community or traditional businesses. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I would like to look at some of the resistance strategies you guys put in place to combat gentrification in Montreal. Uh, Simon, you've been working in Parkex for a few years now, um, especially on like food insecurity. Can you tell us more about your experience? Yes. So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, at La Place Commune, where I work, uh, we're a cooperative in Park Extension. And um, I should start by saying that the work of the cooperative is not explicitly anything related to gentrification or um, the process of gentrification happening. But because that's the reality that all the communities of the neighborhood are facing, it relates a lot in the day to day. Um, uh, practice of our work that we have to deal with these questions and work with the other organizations in the neighborhood of which of which there are many many organizations in the neighborhood um, tenants groups tenants associations and uh, other kinds of uh, social services for the people in the neighborhood to um, help with the myriad problems caused by the displacement process um, specifically at La Place Commune we're working in uh, food security in uh, I'm just trying to situate this and start this in the right way. I guess I should start talking about Park X a little bit for those of you who don't know. Park Extension is a neighborhood in, in Montreal, just um, north of uh, Malax Outremont, uh, right um, between the uh, Chemin de Fer on Beaumont, and uh, south of the 40, the uh, main highway that cuts through Montreal. Um, east of Ville de Montréal, which is a private gated community of wealthy people, and um, west of Saint-Laurent, which is uh, where Parc Jerry is. So there's 
uh, four geographical barriers that have led to park extension being a relatively enclave neighborhood in throughout its entire existence from the the very development of Montreal. Uh, park X has always been um, a little bit isolated because of the fact that it's between the highway, the railroad, and um, the gated community that was originally uh, built to purposefully be a gated community for wealthy people to not have to interact with the people on the other side of the fence that are the poor working class industrial um, people living in poverty. So to start with that context of park extension, um, then I guess the next development in the history of gentrification in the neighborhood is the fact that we're located uh, uh, in the main metro Montreal region, but right north of where the gentrification frontier has been moving for the past 20 years. So gentrification in a city works geographically. It moves along um, a geographical uh, direction that can be clearly seen and obviously manifests itself in the neighborhoods from downtown and Chinatown all the way up through the plateau, through Mile End. Each of these neighborhoods going through different evolutionary processes of gentrification that continue and get more and more aggressive and continue to go further and further north until park extension. So in the last five years, park extension has really witnessed a super aggressive, um, mm, yeah, like increase in uh, the displacement tactics that have been playing out in the neighborhood, which looks like a lot of different things. On the one hand, there was the new University of Montreal campus that opened in 2019. So that was a process that may only have come onto the scene um, and materialized concretely in 2019, but the acquisition of the land that the university is on occurred 10 years ago. So the policies that have been in place to gentrify park extension have been ongoing for a long time, and it's been a very planned and um, mm -hmm. deliberate uh, revitalization of the neighborhood that has been ongoing for many, many, many years now. But it's only in, in 2019 that we saw a really, really aggressive turn in how the gentrification looked because suddenly the new university campus was completed, the new condo developments were completed, the university sold the land that it bought for student housing to become private condo developments, and suddenly tons of people that have been living in the neighborhood no longer can afford their rents, their landlords are using um, displacement tactics like rent evictions, uh, negligence, other kinds of harassment. A lot of people living in the neighborhood are immigrants, are allophone, they don't speak neither French nor English. They are on precarious status for many other reasons. So it's super easy to marginalize people that are already marginalized and make them feel like they have to leave, even if legally they have protections. So that's the context of the neighborhood park extension where we're in right now. And um, there is a lot of resistance and a lot of organizations working to help the people living in the neighborhood. There's the CAP, which is um, uh, the housing association of the neighborhood that does a lot of really amazing work to just uh, exactly help the, the residents that may be facing um, housing problems of any sort be able to deal with that. There's a housing association that tries to um, gather kind of collective resistance by um, getting different tenants together and helping to do different kinds of acts. There's been tons of different actions um, to either help uh, residents getting displaced or to protest um, an action at the mairie or there's a wide range of actions that can be taken and have been taken. So uh, all that to say, La Place Commune where I work, we um, specifically work in food solidarity. So obviously if you are low income and all facing maybe employment and housing problems, it's going to be hard to get food on the table. You've seen the price of food is astronomical recently. The price of gas, the price of living is just going up and up and up. So at La Place Commune, we try and do, um, we have uh, five different aspects of our food solidarity projects, which include um, collective gardens, transformation of unused space in the neighborhood into um, uh, cultivated garden space. My project is about um, fruit trees uh, harvesting and using the fruits that grow in the city and using the urban forest as a, um, a source of uh, urban abundance that we can all profit from and trying to help mobilize people to take advantage of the fact that we live in an urban food forest and we can cultivate food here um, on trees. Uh, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, it's super interesting also because when we think about gentrification, we always think about housing, mostly. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's like more than that. So food insecurity is, is a huge issue. Yeah. And so how do you interact with like locals? Like, do you 
give them food to yes. them? Okay. Yes. So um, I should also say that the kinds of immigrants that have park extension has the highest density of people living in it and the highest density of population of newly arrived immigrants in Canada, of any neighborhood in Canada. And the people who arrived in the 60s and the 50s were mostly Greek and Italian descent. The people who are coming in the last 20, 30 years are a lot of Southeast Asians. Um, and all of these people come from cultures of food cultivation. They all have amazing gardens full of like beautiful vegetables from their um, from their homes, from using their techniques, using their like building styles to build uh, the trellises and the gardens in their yards. So there's already a ton of knowledge and a ton of willpower and a ton of capacity of the residents to be able to cultivate and use food that's culturally um, relevant to them and also a source of nutrition. Um, so we try to, our projects that, um, are about food cultivation, which is the collective garden at the Campus Mill, the backyard gardens, the um, urban gleaning. We always try and be conscious of the foods that um, the local people want to eat and they know and they are uh, interested in eating. So with, I guess I'll name the projects we have to make it more clear, but at La Place Commune, we have a collective garden at the Campus Mill where we cultivate uh, vegetables all summer long with about 50 volunteer members of the collective. We do uh, excursions to very urban farms like an hour away from Montreal to help uh, recuperate food that would otherwise get wasted that the farmers don't have the capacity to harvest themselves or are not going to be able to sell. Um, we have the Fruit Tree Project, which is um, with Nifri de Fondue, the collective that uh, I help organize. and. Um, we have a few other food recuperation projects with Mosa Montreal and the Corbet and the, the organizations that um, recuperate the waste from the big box uh, grocery stores in Montreal. And so with all the food we bring back, we're at 41,000 kilograms of food recuperated this summer only. Uh, we give it out for free in the neighborhood. We give it to the food banks. There's two food banks we work with that are right across the street from La Place Commune, Africo Femina and um, Ressource Action Alimentaire are two uh, food distribution or their organizations that also offer food distribution in the neighborhood. And uh, we go through, and there's actually a few more other uh, organizations and individuals in the neighborhood that do food distribution that we try and give to. And uh, so we take all the food back that we recu recuperate, most of it we try and focus on having fresh, ecologically grown and good quality vegetables because unfortunately a lot of people that live um, in poverty also have to go to the food bank and get old, disgusting, nasty food when they could have access to really nice, well-grown and um, good quality food. So we try and uh, grow super fresh local food just to make it accessible for as many people as possible who are in the neighborhood. Mm. And uh, yeah, we bring it back to La Place Commune. We have a free fridge in La Place Commune. We have a bench where we give out food. We uh, bring deliveries to our neighbors at the food banks next door. There's an individual who gives out food at the Metro every Friday. We share with him also. There's uh, honestly so many people and so many organizations doing so many kinds of different tactics to work on the intersecting problems that are occurring right now in the neighborhood. It's hard to name them all, but uh, in some, yeah. That's the project. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Andy, you've been working on um, on Chinatown for a long time now. Can you tell us more about what the Chinatown Roundtable done so far and how you guys have been? Oops, sorry. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's so interesting to hear the different neighborhoods and cities uh, that has such similarities on the combat and struggles uh, against gentrification and those new developments and even on the food uh, food stance it's uh, this it's really nice to hear about this and uh, I would like to uh, say that actually the Montreal Chinatown has just recently been created because it is an initiative that come from a long series of citizen uh, consultation uh, that started in 2019. Uh, and that follows with the action plan that the city uh, has announced in 2021. So it was in that action plan stated that there was a need for a community-based organization. And my role as a coordinator is really was to first establish the structure that and help mobilize the Chinatown community and with their help uh, define exactly what is their mission, what is the mission of the roundtable? Because as we hear from the different panelists here, um, that 
as a strategy, it is, um, I seriously think that the community involvement is one of the key elements that uh, can help fight against gentrification. So uh, the mission of the roundtable is really to ensure that the voices of the individuals and merchants organizations, because Chinatown is very diverse, um, are being heard, amplified, and also taken into consideration when uh, with a goal of developing this Chinatown uh, on a more human scale, which is already for now, and with inclusive participation. What's interesting is that it has adopted a horizontal structure um, with sectors representing the various areas of the community, but also through working committees where we are able to tackle on some issues. And the roundtable wants to, is. It acts as a liaison to the city of Montreal. And uh, we've recently held our general assembly uh, where we've elected a board representing the diverse community. And here my role is to facilitate those meetings uh, with, uh, because like I said, new organization yeah, emerging, but there are many elements that needs to be reflected on with our members because especially around issues of gentrification, housing issues, uh, green spaces, uh, environmental issues, the mobilization of the youth for the Chinatown. So um, yeah, the next milestones that we are going to do is um, establishing an action plan from the community mm -hmm. and really uh, focus on the different priorities from the working communities because by having working communities, we have this potential to uh, hear the, the people and understand the different needs in the community over there. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, what about you? How have you been working on different projects and being involved in like art initiatives in Chinatown? How, what arts does represent to you when it comes to take back the street? And yeah, I feel like it sounds weird to talk about art when we're talking about people like houses, food and stuff like that, but I, it's just like, I feel like I realize that art is just another language to organize us and just to like gather and like keep those narratives running and have the, our narratives speaking louder. So, so yeah, like I'm, I personally, uh, I'm interested, as I said, in in situ projects. So it's projects that are in in the space. They're temporary, but um, um, those projects are um, anonymous and they mean they mean to be to speak to passerby. So this is another strata of people that we that we reached, but we'll never know, but it's still like, the conversation is still running. And um, last year I interviewed Elijah behind the Instagram account Montreal Then and Now. Uh, he's tackling changing landscapes of Montreal through photography. Um, it's another language and another perspective on gentrification that does that has the same effect. And in our community, there's many Asians led, um, many Asians led organizations and like from the diaspora, like Sticky Rice Magazine that organizes, uh, that creates events um, and it's just beautiful to see you know, those events where you have elders dancing next to you and feeling comfortable and feeling feeling that they are uh, welcome. Um, so so yeah, like art gathers people and animates um, a space to generate conversations. And all summer long at the Asian Night Market, um, there was a solid program of young artists, uh, young Asian artists that kept acknowledging the struggle and situation of the neighborhood before every activity. So it puts the narrative running and the reality up front. And I really wish for art to extend outside of our own audience or elite or just like whatever it is that makes people feel like they need a PhD to understand art. Um, I feel like we forget that everything comes from the ground up and we need to take take back art and make it serves in our like activism and conversations. And as I was saying before, like if art is a vague vehicle for narratives, uh, it's important for artists to fight to have their narrative told the way the community wants it, regardless of all the, um, regardless of the pressure that's done to do otherwise, regardless of the capitalist uh, pressure that's that's that asked them to speak about what's expected from them and this is an an assimilation resistant move and it resists what i call cultural gentrification so thank you so much guys for like wow so interesting um maggie uh, i know you've been working a lot on um grassroots movements in oakland Namely, um, Moms for Housing and Sogoriate uh, Land Trust. Sorry for the pronunciation that is probably 
awful. Um, it's two, it's uh, two examples of black and indigenous women led movement fighting dispossession and displacement in Oakland. Uh, how does, uh, how do like Wawa's, uh, Simone's and Andy's um, experience resonate with your research and your work? Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to speak first a little bit to Wawa's point about art as well, because that really resonates with me. Um, I feel like, like you were saying, art is incredibly powerful in how it, it calls it to our attention to issues in a different way. It's visceral and it can engage people in ways that, you know, a talk like this or, you know, a poster or something else doesn't have that capacity. Um, and something that really struck me in in my dissertation work is how a lot of the people, the activists that were leading anti-displacement movements in Oakland were artists themselves. And so how often that sort of inter intersected and, and aligned um, and how people, that was one of the major pieces of my dissertation was actually looking at different art forms that was trying to convey the, the message of what was transpiring in the city, what was being lost. And so this was like in the form of performance of visual art, street art, you know, sound, poetry, et cetera. So just, I just wanted to like lift up what you were saying and like, like the, the art has an incredibly important role in these movements, you know? Um, and I especially appreciate what you were saying before about, you know, even the fact that you've been able to make it so that you don't have um, art, artists painting murals coming from outside that have no connection and understanding of the neighborhood and the community, like that in itself is a huge accomplishment, right? Because you can make these art forms that um, are representative of the peoples that live in the neighborhood. So I think that's really powerful. Um, and then just in, in response, um, as I was listening to Simone speak as well, it made me really think a lot about um, the Segorite Land Trust, which is, um, uh, oh, how, how much context can I give? Um, it's an indigenous woman led land trust um, that uh, has arose in the past five years, um, but also has uh, deep rooted connections to longer histories of indigenous organizing in Oakland. Um, it's a Loni led, women led. And what essentially they're, they're doing is um, they're facilitating the return of plots of land across Oakland and in the broader East Bay area um, to a loan east stewardship. Um, and these are plots of land that are either owned by uh, nonprofits, by individual property owners, sometimes by the city itself. Um, but it's they essentially come to steward the land and then um, use the space either partially as um, sites of cultural revitalization because the Ohlone in the United States context, uh, they're not a federally recognized tribe. And so they do not have any land claims. Their lands are all within the San Francisco Bay area. So this opens up a whole other conversation on the role of urbanization, whether or not uh, tribes were able to be recognized by the state. But um, anyways, back to how I see the resonance with what you were speaking to Simone was um, particularly after the pandemic hit um, and we saw you know, an increase in food insecurity um, and just people's access to healthy foods. Uh, the Segorite Land Trust is in this, particularly in their plots that are in East Oakland, which is the most low income and most um, racially diverse parts of the city they began a mutual aid program of passing out um, vegetables and fruits that they were growing on these plots of land um, to make sure that the, the neighborhood residents surrounding uh, these plots that have been rematriated were um, having their needs met. Um, and this is only uh, continued now when we see the inflation crisis that is continuing to like stretch people's ability to feed themselves. Um, so I think about how important um, mutual aid is in as, as I think others were pointing out earlier in relation to these broader housing crises, we also have to think about, you know, food crises, insecurity, climate crises, et cetera, and how I mean, there's a need to sort of meet people's immediate need. Um, I don't want to take all the time, so I don't know if you want me to talk about Moms for Housing as well or if we could pass it. Uh, it's just, it's already six, actually time flies. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just going to go straight to my last question so you guys can have some time to develop on it. Um, we know that like we've seen that gentrification seems to be like a never ending process and to a lot of people it became kind of inevitable. Um, also there's other people claiming that actually gentrification brings, you know, more money and like makes streets safer. So, you know, my question is how can we, you know, is, is it actually possible to 
make a neighborhood a better place to live for everybody without attracting outside uh, developers and investors if it's actually possible to develop alternative models of, de of neighborhood development that do not rely on exclusion and displacement of um, the community. What, a, what is your insight set on this one? Oh. <laughs> I know it's, so, it's no, a yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so of course it's possible. Um, you know, that's why we're, that's why we're all here, I think, because we think it's possible, you know? Um, I mean, I guess I would say a couple of things. One is, uh, I would, when we're thinking about this, I think it's worth just calling into question the idea that things need to be better at all. Not because they don't, just because the whole idea of improvement and progress are really, really integral to settler colonialism and racial capitalism. And so maybe we should pause for a second and, th and think about whether like a neighborhood like Park X or Chinatown needs to be better. Maybe it could just stay the same. Okay. But then maybe there might be some, some things that people want to change. Mm -hmm. Um, so then we can, you know, have that discussion, but try to have that discussion outside of like taking for granted ideas of what improvement looks like, because what the most vulnerable people in the neighborhood might need might look really different from what like planning discourses and, you know, urban futures discourses tell us are important. And then to bring that about, I mean, clearly we need to, um, you know, get capital out of housing and property as much as possible and regulate uh, it to the extent that it continues to exist. And so things like, like actual rent control, actual eviction controls, and then social housing are really important. And then how do you bring that about? You have to organize for it. And, and one of the things I found really productive about listening to all of you today is that sometimes I get trapped into thinking that the way you organize around gentrification is to get people to organize as tenants. And so these housing organizations are super important and they are, but I also think that it's, probably you're not realistic to imagine that everyone's going to organize as a tenant or that there'll be enough people to do that that you can actually win and so i think it's really important that that that, that tenant organizing happens but that also that people organize in different kinds of ways around identities that matter to them and so there's various kinds of oppressed identities or communal identities that matter more to people and maybe, maybe it's around gardening maybe it's around protecting chinese heritage um you know it could be around a, a right maybe it's as like people who are immigrants or who lack citizenship status, maybe it's as workers. I think it's possible to get more people organized around the identities that matter to them and then figuring out how all of those different groups, regardless of what exactly they're organizing around, can be involved in a struggle against gentrification, which would seek to put limits on, on the freedom of capital and that would seek to remove capital um, from, from housing uh, you know, as soon as possible, but that's probably a long-term struggle. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what about you, Maggie? Have you anything to something you would like to add? Yeah, no, I just think that was a really, a really excellent point, Ted. I mean, I think, um, I think, like at least from the planning side of things, like there's there's a need to be like in dialogue with community and with neighborhoods, and and I mean that in the sense of true dialogue, not performative dialogue, right? If if people don't want something to be done, it shouldn't be done. Um, we shouldn't cave to like the broader interests. Um, and I think relatedly to, to what Ted was just saying, you know, I always, I always take inspiration from Leanne Simpson's theorization of constellations of co-resistance, right? So as Ted, you were just pointing out, you know, people, uh, maybe it's not realistic for everyone to organize as tenants, um, but, to, but to be sort of in, involved in, in movements that, that do really speak to them and in, in which you are world making in a way that um, you're creating the kind of future that you want to live in. And then thinking about how these different movements sort of work in relation to one another um, to create something otherwise. So I think we can't sort of foreclose the possibility of, of creating the city otherwise or creating a space otherwise. We really have to sort of actively be you know, organizing and, and working to put it into practice. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I would like to open the floor to the audience if there is any questions that you guys want to ask. If it's yes, you can just raise your hand. Any question? Okay. Oh, thank you. Someone behind you. Yeah, thank you for this amazing panel. I was just observing that uh, many disciplines and uh, uh, also activists are involved with this uh, complex issue. And uh, my question is that what kind of initiative can 
put all these forces together and how do you see the role of universities, whether in terms of social infrastructure or physical in infrastructure? Thank you. you yeah, um, as, the, as the chat around table uh, is really a space where we want to gather up all the different stakeholders that are going to tackle on those issues. It, I think it will definitely help uh, by having the grassroots organization being involved directly to uh, tackle on the gentrification issue or even the housing issues, which right now are still ongoing conversations. And uh, as I hear from all of you, uh, and as an urban planner, I, I understand that there's this change in uh, policy where there's always this urban renewal projects that's coming up that displace people, but can we use these policies to maybe uh, um, take those to, do, to not displace anymore and really refigure out how the different uh, bylaws or uh, policies we can use to change it up and shape the future that we want to do. For example, there's this new planning program that is coming up with the city of Montreal where the citizen can think about how we want to develop the city and it is the opportunity for us citizen community uh, uh, people to uh, put our effort and advice on changing shaping the future of montreal and especially for for me as a, a coordinator for the round table it's an opportunity to bring these issues over there and change up Um, <clears throat> so I think there's a lot of things that could be said in response to your question. It was a big question, but um, one thing that I think of, if your question was how can we get all these different voices and struggles to work together, uh, was that about it? Yeah. Um, well, kind of like Maggie was talking about um, the many different approaches, her last reflection, it makes me think that uh, there are so many different ways that we can mobilize people to be part of their own communities and to do the kinds of actions and appropriate space and the urban place that they live to become something that is relevant and culturally useful for them. That it's there's not one thing that can happen, there's not one kind of organizing that can happen, but many, many kinds of communities and people with affinity and neighbors and people who live in proximity, proximity to each other can be doing many kinds of actions just to work with the people who are near them um, on any kind of issue that touches them. So if the issue that brings you together is food or um, housing or art or um, appropriating public space so that your kids can play together outside, whatever it is, there's so many different topics that need to be addressed and that just simple collective action can do something just to appropriate and change the way that we interact with the city around us. One thing that I think is important is um, there's nothing really we can do as an individual. There's no individual action that will make you a gentrifier and anti-gentrifier. There's only actions you can take as a collectivity with other people in solidarity that are ever going to make a difference. And um, so, yeah, that was one thing. I had one other thing I wanted to say uh, in response to the other part of your question, but I'm forgetting now. <laughs> You can think about it, but I just want to reflect to what you were saying. Um, as in the as in the context of art, there's something that I really want to make clear right now is the fact that art is more a state of mind than an actual discipline or a form. So just every initiatives and like especially when you're trying to revolutionize something or have like a revolution, you have to be subversive and creative. So just what you did with gardening, this is artistic, purely. This is this is subversive. This is going out of what is expected from it, and it's a solution itself. And this is art. So I just want to, I just want to, um, you know, when I was talking about, I hope that the art can get out of this, its own elite and audience. Well, um, first thing is to actually realize that we all possess the means to be an artistic and just comes for your education, the way you've been raised and all the, all the things that you've been told when you were young, you can use that and flip, flip the tools that you, you've studied and stuff like that. Well, anyways, I don't know if you, I remember. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> So the second part of your question is about what universities can do, and that's going to be like another four hours of conversation if we really get into it. But um, the university and park extension, for example, the new campus of the University of Montreal, there are so many things that they could have done over the past 10 years that they didn't do, and they expressly chose to do the opposite to make it even worse. 
Um, so for one, if you're a student at a university, it's your job to hold the university accountable that you go to and to organize with other students and to make sure that you're aware and um, contesting when universities are making policy decisions that are going to negatively impact all the residents of the neighborhood that are in proximity to the university. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of things the university can do to help the development process, help the development process be less um, uh, I guess destructive, like for example, having student housing available to not put a pressure on the public or on the housing market um, in the neighborhood around, uh, which is something that the University of Montreal expressly did not do, even though they originally said they would do. Um, so there's so many different approaches that students can take to put pressure on their university to make sure they're upholding the policies that are actually going to be beneficial for the communities living around the university. Um, and maybe I shouldn't keep talking. <laughs> it was great, actually. Yeah. Um, do you want to add something? No, you're good? OK. Um, it's getting late, so is anybody want to ask another question? Sorry, guys. Realize it's late. Oh, there's OK. Where is it? Um, I cannot. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, so my name is Mary Sui. I'm actually a faculty member at Concordia. Um, so it's unfortunate that Wawa just stepped away because I just wanted to jump in and say, thank God somebody's talking about the kind of uh, significance and the kind of activism of art in relationship to community kind of building and uh, our, you know our battle against gentrification. But there is a point that I feel like I would like to invite the panel to kind of discuss because she raised it early on in her uh, conversation about the challenges that artists face and others, you know, community organizers when they go into a community to try and motivate and also inspire action. And that sometimes we're met with, oh, I don't care. Um, on many levels, since I am actually actively involved in the community and have worked in activism for years, I do think that as activists ourselves, we have to be cautious about how we approach the community, in which ways that they feel that they are actually going to be empowered and engaged in the process, as opposed to being tokenized and used as sort of tools for activism. But so I would like to hear from some of the panelists about some of the challenges you're facing and also some of the potential positive kind of like directives that can be used for kind of getting the community more involved. Um, like, I mean, I really appreciated the conversation about, you know, get them where their interest is or work through, you know, their identity and what they think they can identify with. But are there any other strategies that the group could um, bring forth? And I sorry, I, I should mention that I'm also a member of the Chinatown Roundtable. So hearing this kind of conversation is really fruitful for us. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, for this, for sure that uh, in the activism world, it is very hard to mobilize the community, but we have to ask ourselves, what's in it for them? What What is really the end goal of it? And as soon as people understand that there's uh, possibilities in uh, the, the upcoming future, uh, then I think it will greatly uh, help them understand that there's, uh, that their voice matter and that is exactly what the roundtable wants to uh, reassure: is that uh, it is a place where the different, the diverse community voices, where we can engage conversation, hard conversations that uh, will take on. So, yeah, these are the first steps that we should start on: what, and then understanding why that's causing some uh, elements. So. Um, I guess one thing for me uh, that sticks out, it's kind of hard for me to, well, I think the word community has become so overused that it's meaningless now. And when we talk about um, how we can mobilize a community or approach a community, it's a kind of approach that doesn't really resonate with me. Like if you're part of that community, you know it and you know what the struggles are and you're in solidarity with them already. There's no nothing alien about like approaching a community, trying to get to know them 
you're in that community, you know what the problems are. And if you recognize that there is a community existing that has um, problems that they're all facing together and it's a common struggle, then it's clear that the common um, issue that the people who are in that community are gonna be facing might be whatever kind of um, precarity or housing or whatever the concrete issue might be. But it's hard for me to uh, kind of uh, approach an issue when the idea of community is that abstract because um it's a word that really has lost its meaning because of its overuse i guess so yeah i'm repeating myself but um uh to me if you want to mobilize a community it's because you're part of that community and that issue touches your heart just as much as it touches their heart and so there's a solidarity that naturally arises because you're all in this struggle together and if it's not like that then you're not part of that community and you're coming from the outside and if you're an outsider then you have to listen and you have to listen until you understand and then once you understand you can be part of that struggle and you can fight with them but um every community knows what their issues are and they're going to express it themselves if you give them the space to say what their problem is and to say what they're living and experiencing and if it's something that is unknown to you, then you just have to give them the space to express it and uh, they're going to be able to mobilize themselves. If it's not your community, know that they're going to be able to mobilize themselves and they're going to be able to work together if given the, you know, the, the tools and the opportunity to do so. Exactly what I wanted to hear. Because I, I, I did want to sort of like have someone on the panel point that out that, you know, we shouldn't approach this notion of community activism and community building as if it's sort of a singular kind of concept that's easily, you know, you just go in and, and, and parachute yourselves in because I do think that with every community, that's just like an enclave for multiple kind of uh, groups of people, groups of interests, groups of identities. So I felt that that was a conversation that needed to be brought to the fore. I mean, I think you just said it beautifully. And so I'll just add one thing. It's like, I think that there are sometimes roles for outsiders, but they're subservient to the people who are already organizing in those communities. Like I think of an example that a group that used to come visit and, and sort of give really inspiring lectures at Concordia for, for a bunch of years is Movement for Justice in El Barrio that organizes in East Harlem. Um, and they're like a lot of uh, Latino immigrants facing uh, facing ex um, displacement. I mean, they were displaced in, in Central America, then ended up in Harlem where they're facing displacement again. And one of the things that they talked about is like, they continually have these people who come from outside the neighborhood with a little bit of privilege, or maybe a lot of privilege, asking how they can help. And what the, the group will give them to do are very menial tasks. And often the people will do it for one day and then they'll never come back. Um, and so like, I think, you know, oftentimes there are tasks for people who don't live in the neighborhood to do the work. It's just, you're not going to be leading the struggle. You're going to be taking direction from the people who do live in the neighborhood. Um, and so that sort of finds some kind of response to the idea of like parachuting in, like you can just like walk in and ask some questions, see what people are doing and see how you might be able to support. And maybe the answer is there's nothing for you to do, but probably there's something if you, if you're paying attention, you're humble and you're willing to like play a, a minor role in the struggle instead of coming in and becoming the hero. Yeah, that's very interesting. Because if I can add on that, with the experience that I just, uh, with the chat round table, is that there's a lot of, of media attention to it and a lot of people wants to help and uh, that's what happened and uh, they have to understand how they can help and really participate from the chinatown itself is uh, a place where uh, a lot of mobility happens because people live there or don't they go through uh, they live through the metropolitan uh, of montreal and they want to help out with this kind of uh, struggles that we are living in. So definitely understanding what is the objective to help and helping them understand that from, from the outside is good. And then uh, only the people from the community will understand the struggle. So yeah, that's that. Thank you. Um... Uh, is there any other questions? Just the last one before. Concluding. Oh, yeah, there is one. Oh, 
Uh, thank you so much for all your words uh, and for the presence to talk about arts, even though Wawa has gone. Um, I was wondering, this might be a little bit too far out there, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ingrid Waldron and her work on the Enrich Project, and there's something in the water about environmental racism. One of the projects that the coalitions uh, that they're spearheading is putting forward is a bill against environmental racism. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about grassroots efforts here and building from the community, but do you see any potential or possibly any uh, problems with having uh, a law that would enshrine or uh, a strategy that would go against environmental racism coming from the federal government? Do you want to say something? Do you guys want to say? Well, I barely have a response because I'm not familiar with the, the project, but uh, I mean, just to say that environmental racism is a thing that exists and we can see just a quick case study in Park Extension, how as a disinvested neighborhood for the last 20 years, it's a heat island that lacks um, trees and you can have mature trees on public streets and pretty much every other uh, public street of Montreal, but in Park Extension, there's a lack of trees and it's like two degrees in general warmer than the rest of the city because it's a heat island. Uh, and now that the university is there and a lot of speculations happening and the land is changing and there's new condos and there's new owners and there's new developments, now suddenly the city is super interested in planting trees. So uh, as soon as they're displacing the people that were there without the trees. So just an example of how environmental racism affects our neighborhood, even though I don't know what the law is. And maybe I'll just pick up on the, the idea of a federal law. And so, you know, we, we tried to frame all of this in terms of like these big systems of power, settler colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy, et cetera. And obviously the federal government isn't going to abolish capitalism or settler colonialism or white supremacy. Uh, I think we need to recognize that and we need to be, you know, building power, organizing um, with a long view towards like, you know, combating these systems. I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be called a liberal for this, but I'm not, um, is I do think that, 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 that it does make sense to be looking for wins along the way. And a lot of those wins involve policy changes. And so whether it's a federal law against environmental racism or it's like a provincial rent registry or it's increased government investment in social housing, I do think that that we need to be like seeking those wins while never forgetting that like it's not by nego like getting a meeting with the important politician that's going to actually win the thing. We have to be, you know, building power in communities such that they have to listen. Um, sort of a cliche, but that's, that's as far as I've ever gotten with that reflection. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I would like to thank you all. Andy, well, we already left, Simon, Ted, uh, Maggie, thank you so much, guys, for um, sharing your insights, your experience with us. I would like to thank you, to thank the fourth base team. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank Joseph, um, Rasha, and Afi uh, for their help planning this event. I would also like to thank you guys, the audience, both online and in person, for attending. Uh, I hope this conversation um, helps you all get a better sense of what gentrification is about and how it connects to many other issues besides housing uh, and how we can get to organize and fight back. Um, gentrification is much more than housing. It's about social and cultural preservation and ownership. So I hope that this discussion will incite us all to reflect on our positionality and think about what we could do next, both individually and collectively, to preserve our cities and neighborhoods, for instance, by volunteering for a local nonprofit, by creating and nurturing support networks in our neighborhoods by learning the history of our cities, by interacting and listening to our neighbors. Um, before concluding, I would like to cite uh, geography Leslie Kern in her last book, Gentrification is Inevitable and Other Lies, um, quote unquote, responsibility is not a burden, it's an opportunity to use our capacities and resources, whatever form those take, to work toward building cities and neighborhoods that support human and non-human flourishing nurturing relationships of care and give all of us what we need a home thank you guys thank you so much
If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at CU Fourth Space. We'd love to hear from you. The Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffin, and produced with Anna Boklebeck. Editing by Chanel Lees Marshall and Maximus Delmar. And our theme music, courtesy of Supercontinent. Thanks for listening.